Have you ever been diagnosed with a hip flexor strain or a hip flexor tendonitis, but the pain just won't go away? Well, my name's Dr. Ashley, and I'm a physical therapist. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about something called femoroacetabular impingement, otherwise known as FAI or hip impingement syndrome that can sometimes be mistaken as a hip flexor strain or tendonitis. What I would like to do is educate you as to how to tell the difference between the two ailments and if you are experiencing an FAI, what you can do to help get rid of your discomfort. Before I go into how you can tell the difference between a hip flexor strain or tendon problem and FAI, I want to go over the hip anatomy a little bit with you. Let's start with the bony anatomy. So the hip is a ball and socket joint that has multiple degrees of freedom or planes of movement similar to our shoulder. The socket of the hip is made up of the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. And those three bones actually make up where the femur inserts into our actual hip socket. Now, the hip socket, the acetabulum, is surrounded by what we call a labrum. The hip labrum is a piece of kind of cartilaginous material that actually supports the hip. It's like a suction cup and it lets the hip stay a little more stable. Now, next up is the actual femur, basically the ball of the hip. The femur is the moving portion of our hip that flexes, extends, abducts, adducts, and rotates. Now, I don't have a fancy model to show you that, but let's dive right in now to talk about the musculature of the hip. Now let's talk muscular anatomy. As you can see by this picture, there are a lot of muscles that help support our hip joint. On one side, I've stripped it down so you can see a lot of what we would call the intrinsic muscles, the supporting muscles a little bit better. And the other side, you see a lot of the general muscles of the region, all of your quad muscles, all of your hip extensors, your knee flexors, your hamstrings. But what you have to remember is that all of these are a big proponent in stabilizing the hip joint. The hip is a ball and socket joint, like I already explained. It has multiple degrees of freedom, which means it moves in multiple planes of motion. When you look at the hip, it moves forward, backward, flexes and extends, it moves in and out, adducts and abducts, and it rotates. It rotates internally or medially and externally, which is laterally. And all of these structures help to do that. Now, I'm not going to go into naming each and every single one because that would be a lot of time. I'm going to focus on the ones that we're looking at when we're dealing with hip flexor issues and also the main supporting muscles that we typically work on in the clinic. Well, if we're looking at hip flexors, we're looking at the, ili or the iliopsoas complex, which is the psoas and then the iliacus. And then what we also focus on most of the time is the rectus femoris. Yes, one of your quads is also a hip flexor. We then, if we're looking at kind of supporting structures of the hip, on top of your hip flexors, which are commonly thought to be as a major cause of many hip issues, we have to look at the adductor muscles. And what you should know is that some of those are actually supporting structures and help to flex the hip as well. And then we turn the hip around, right? We turn the, the torso and the body around here. What we'll see here are some of the hip rotators, gluteus minimus, right? This actually internally and externally rotates the hip depending on the location of the fiber. You have your piriformis and then we have small little intrinsic muscles. I'm not going to go over every single name. If you want to look them up, feel free, but they all help to externally rotate and stabilize the hip joint. If we're looking at some of the other big movers of our hip, right, we have our gluteus maximus, which extends that hip joint, right? And then we also have our gluteus medius, which is also a very important stabilizer of the hip. It prevents what we call hip drop, and it kind of just keeps your torso level as you're walking and moving, right? We can also mention the TFL, the tensor fascia lata. This has to do with IT band syndrome sometimes. Obviously, I'm not talking about that now, but this also helps to internally rotate and flex the hip. Now, Obviously, all of these muscles are extremely important when it comes to the hip functioning well, and you're going to learn later on in this video some exercises to target some of those smaller muscles in order to help just keep your hip healthy, especially if you're dealing, things, dealing with things such as FAI. 
So as you can see from the anatomy demonstration, there are a lot of structures in the hip. A lot of different things can cause anterior hip pain. The big thing today is we really are only going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the hip flexor muscle complex, and we're going to talk about femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, or hip impingement. Now, I will say, I'm going to go over some other pathologies towards the end of this video that you should pay attention to. The reason being is that they may make you seek medical attention a little bit quicker than if you're dealing with a simple hip flexor issue or just hip impingement in general. So how do you know the difference between a hip flexor issue and an FAI? Well, let's start off with hip flexors. Remember, hip flexors are simply several muscles put together in the front of our hip that actually allow us to raise our hip up towards our chest. They help us jump, they help us run and do activity. I always know if this uh, pain came on a little bit more acutely with some type of fast movement, it is likely that you might have strained your, your hip flexor. The other thing that you should know is that there are telltale signs that you have more of a muscular issue than an FAI. Those include things such as pain with stretch of the muscle. So as you can see here, this is what we call a modified Thomas test. If you feel a good discomfort in that front of that thigh as you do this, it's likely coming from the muscle. Although I should note, you can have a little bit of a deeper pain with this too that may indicate something else. Now, the other thing is that if you go ahead and raise your knee up towards your chest and push it away from you, right? Sometimes it's easier to have someone else help you do this. Then you may also get some pain in that hip flexor region. And that yes, that can be indicative of a hip flexor strain or a hip flexor tendon issue rather than an FAI. One other thing that I like to know is that a lot of the times when we're dealing with a tendon problem, no matter where it is in our body, if it is in a state of kind of this just general tendonitis or tendinopathy, right? What we see is that as you do activity, it tends to get better and it tends to go away. So keep that in mind. You may have a little bit of discomfort afterwards, but you can typically get through your activity without having to stop. Now let's chat impingement a little bit. What actually is an impingement syndrome? Basically what it means is that you have the socket, right? And you have the head of the femur. And as they move in different directions, because the hip's a ball and socket joint, and it has many degrees of freedom, which means it can move in more than just one or two directions, right? What happens is there's premature contact somewhere in that joint between two bones or two structures, right? Sometimes we may feel a pinch due to cartilage. Sometimes we may feel a pinch due to the, due to the hip labrum. But if we actually want to diagnose a true FAI, it is actually bony prominences that cause that discomfort. There are several different types of impingement, right? When we look at hip impingement, we can deal with a cam lesion, a pincer lesion, or a mixed lesion, right? So what is a cam lesion? Well, here's a picture of a cam lesion. A cam lesion is basically where you have an extra buildup of bone on the head of that femur, right? So you are kind of moving, and as you go ahead and you lift that up, there's extra bone that sits right in this area. If we look at a pincer lesion, what that is, is there's an extra little bit of bone that comes out, right? As you can see in this picture, comes out of the socket, right? Right off that acetabulum, there's a little bit of extra bone that sits there. And what that does, premature contact. You can also have a mixture of the two together. You can only imagine what that looks like, right? So you have a little bit of bone on the head of the femur and you have a little bit of extra bone around the, um, the socket of the joint. And as you move, it's just uncomfortable. Now, how do you diagnose this or how is it diagnosed in the clinic, right? A lot of the times in order to get a proper diagnosis of hip impingement, there's three things. We need to have the physical examination, right? We're listening to your subjective report and we are also doing some sort of imaging to see what your hip joint looks like. Now, I will note that sometimes when you are dealing with a hip impingement, you may have some cartilage and labral involvement of the hip. However, what is often recommended is conservative care before any type of other care is done, depending on the severity of what's seen on imaging. Now to backtrack a little bit, what are some of the tests that you can do to say, hey, I might have a little bit of an impingement versus just a hip flexion problem? 
The first thing is, is that if you feel this, you feel a catch, a lock, a pop, or you have discomfort in the bottom or deep ranges of hip flexion. So in the bottom of a squat, or when you pull your knee all the way up to your chest, right? That may be indicative of a hip impingement. The other thing, if you are lying on your back and basically you pull your knee across your chest, just like this, and you get a pretty good pinch in your groin area or anywhere in the hip, that also may be a sign that you are dealing with an impingement versus a strict hip flex flexor tendon problem or a muscle strain. Now, after I went over that all, you're probably asking yourself, how do these things happen? Well, a lot of the time, they just happen. It happens most of the time during adolescence as you're doing a specific activity. If you do a repetitive sport or just simply as you grow, some people deposit more bone than others. So there's not necessarily one defined reason as to why impingement happens. But what can you do to take care of it? That's always a question that we get. A lot of the time, what people try to do is more passive types of things, stretching, doing some type of like a banded mobilization. But a lot of the time, what we see is people actually need a strengthening activity. So what I am going to do is give you five exercises that I'd like you to try to start doing to see if you can help that groin pain that maybe sometimes radiates into your thigh or into your butt or maybe even into your back subside a little bit. Now, just a few things before I get into these exercises. One, make sure you hit that subscribe button for us. And if you're enjoying our content, share our channel with your friends. The other thing, these can all be made easier and harder with different variations. I'm not gonna go through all of the variations in this video. However, if you do have questions about them, don't hesitate to post them in the comment section below and we'll be sure to get back to you with the answer. Some things to note when you are doing exercises for something such as impingement syndrome or that FAI. One thing you need to remember is that your pain level should remain between zero to two out of 10 and nothing more. The reason being is we want to decrease the pain and the compression and the inflammation in the hip so you can continue to just get better and progress through what you want to do. The other thing that we recommend is not squatting below parallel. Basically, you want to keep your squats to less than 90 degrees of hip flexion. You want to keep them to less than that, right? So you have to modify factors in your normal life and things that you normally do regularly so that you can help this get better. The first exercise that I recommend is a front loaded box squat. Why a front loaded squat? Because it puts more emphasis on your quads and decreased emphasis on your posterior chain and your hip region. The box also keeps you from going below parallel or 90 degrees. Go ahead and load this up. You can do it in a goblet form or a true front squat form. Try it for three to four sets of eight to 10. What I noted a lot of instructional videos on YouTube lacked are rotational based exercises. What I'm doing here is your basic clamshell, simple, easy, but I'm rotated forward to prevent utilizing my back a little bit in this movement, which is common for people with hip pain. The next exercise I go into is a similar motion. However, my hip is slightly abducted. I'm still in that rotated forward position, but I'm doing external rotation in an abducted position, which should make your hip burn. The last is hip internal rotation in this abducted position. Give it a shot. Try three sets of eight to 10 or even eight to 12 for each of these. The next exercise I often prescribe for hip impingement type of symptoms is a single leg bridge. Sometimes you might have to decrease the height of the bridge just because you might experience some discomfort in the front of your hip. However, these are awesome to start building up your posterior chain strength, working on your glutes, and even your hip abductors a little bit. Try this for three to four sets of eight to 10 and see how you do. I love side planks for hip problems. The reason being is it is a great strengthener of the hip abductors, an extremely important muscle group. This is your basic side plank. If this is too difficult, go ahead and try this modified version. Try holding for five rounds of 20 seconds or so and increase as you can.
Next up is a Copenhagen plank. You can perform this at the shin, at the foot, or even at the knee to make it a little bit easier. The longer the lever arm, the harder this is. What you're going to do, pulling up through that leg on the chair, you raise yourself up and hold this. I would start with 10 second holds and trying to progress to 20 and 30. I would try it, say, five times to start. And as you increase your time, decrease the number of repetitions. I know I said five exercises, but here's your bonus one, number six. This is just an elevated deadlift. What I recommend here is elevating your deadlift to decrease your hip flexion moment, decrease the compression at the hip joint. You can do a rack pull deadlift, trap bar deadlift, or even just a deadlift on blocks. I would go ahead, perform three to four sets, eight to 10, keeping your pain between a zero and two. So now that I've given you some things to start thinking about to help with that anterior hip pain due to impingement, I wanted to go over those different types of things that call, could cause you to need more medical assistance. Now, what I'm talking about, these are more sinister pathologies in the hip, things that also do show anterior hip pain. However, the pain is typically very excruciating. It doesn't come and go. It's always there. It's difficult to walk. You're not really feeling great and you can't really do any sort of exercise without significant discomfort. These things include stress fractures and stage osteoarthritis. And for young adolescent or youth athletes, we have to be weary of things such as apophysitis. So a little bit of an irritation where some of the tendons attached to the anterior hip or something called a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, which is basically the femoral head actually shifts a little bit and moves off of actually the femoral neck. It's not necessarily super common, but it is something that if you have a young athlete with excruciating anterior hip pain, and you always see maybe that their foot's always turned out or turned in or a certain way, you should be weary of it. All of those things, especially that relentless pain that doesn't go away and keeps you up at night, you should be getting checked out by say your local orthopedist or sports medicine physician, or if you really want to go get screened by your local physical therapist first, and they can send you in the right direction. Now, I hope you learned a little bit of something about hip flexor issues versus hip impingement. The big thing here is making sure no matter what you're dealing with, that you modify your activities appropriately. You really shouldn't be pushing through too much pain, especially when it comes to that hip impingement type sin symptom, right? If you are dealing with more of a hip flexor, hip tendonitis type symptom, we say zero to four is fine. But remember for hip impingement, zero to two is where you want to stay. Remember some of the things you don't necessarily want to continue to have a lot of compression in that hip joint. If you're feeling it while sitting, or if you're feeling it in a deep squat, Go ahead, stop breaking that 90 degrees. Don't go to parallel. And if you have to sometimes, lean back in that chair, all right? The other thing here is that you really need to make sure that you are not continuously irritating it. Don't push yourself through that discomfort. Remember, I just said it, zero to two is your mark. And make sure that you just keep doing what you can and don't necessarily force yourself through too much. So as always, Dr. Ashley here. I will be back in a few short weeks with some more information.